Today is the day for your project presentation. So we will start with this group uh, presentation, the first group presentation. Uh, they are Kif, Akmal and Megad. So they will present about drug delivery, uh, focusing on self-assembly and their application. Lah. So without further ado, I will ask uh, this group to present. Ya, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So I will be doing the first part for this presentation. And then, uh, first of all, do you guys have any idea what drug delivery is? Just a brief idea, we'll do it. Not the illegal drug. How the drug is delivered to the site. Nice. Boleh, boleh. Okay, so I'm going to explain what drug delivery is. So drug delivery is a method or technique of giving pharmacological uh, ingredient to people and also animal for therapeutic benefit. And then um, nasal and pulmonary routes of medication and administration are becoming increasingly important in the treatment of illnesses. So uh, for peptide and protein therapies, these methods represent viable alternative for parental drug administration. Okay, then we have self-assembly. So Dr. Wan mentioned in the last class that um, we have the example of self-assembly where there is a shredded paper at the end, and then when we submerge it in the water, they will disperse the, the, the end of the paper will spread. And then once we take out from the water, it will assemble themselves. So, um, for example, like they were, the paper were things uh, spontaneously arranged themselves. So what we have here is also Example like a magnet. So, I don't cover one. So, what they they will self assemble without any um, extra force. So, this is just an example. So, we, they will assemble themselves and then they will become uh, a structure. So, uh, in a scientific way, self-assemble is uh, a pre-existing component of a chaotic system uh, spontaneously combined to generate a new structure. And then the process is known as molecular self-assembly when the constituent uh, molecules are molecules. While self-assembly in chemistry is well known as non-covalent interaction between molecular units can be characterized as the spontaneous and reversible formation of uh, structure. One of the first characteristics of self-assembly is the system is that it acts on a level and then the nan nanostructure is built on uh, itself uh, without any external intervention. So the main, the main article that from this article we have the problem statement is that the cancer chemotherapy is complicated by the establishment of resistance to many drugs. So the iron dependent uh, build up of lipid peroxides, which results in peroxosis, has the potential to reverse multi drug resistance. And then, in spite of this, uh, the simultaneous delivery of the iron sources, peroxosis inducing agents, as well as, as well known as um, mitigation and improved circulation carri uh, carriers inside matrices, remains a key problem. And then, based on this article, we have that cancer is the most um, malignant disease which causes mortality worldwide. And then uh, solid tumors uh, require high efficiency, high efficiency therapies techniques as our expertise in nanomedicine grows. The, this therapeutic method delivers therapeutic payloads to the tumor target efficiently. So multi-drug resistant MDR hinders treatment efficacy and causes failure. So mutations in ATP binding cassettes uh, transporters can cause multi-drug resistance. And anti-cancer drug research has generated drug resistance models. So several techniques for dealing with MDR have been established. So including the control of reactive or sedative species, ROS stress. So for the next part, I will pass it to Akmal to continue on how self-assembly helps in drug delivery.
Okay, assalamualaikum everyone. Okay, so I will continue with uh, how actually the self assembly um, helps in drug delivery system. Okay, so firstly, uh, in addition to what Akif said just now, uh, currently self assembled uh, nanomaterials are finding a wide variety, <coughs> wide variety in the area of um, next, uh, the wide variety in the area of nanotechnology, biosensors, uh, and biomedical science because of their there are five actually why we use the self assembly materials. So the first one is in expensiveness. Second one is spontaneity, versatility, simplicity, and scalability. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, so recent uh, advancements in the area of drug delivery have been opened up a new avenue to develop new drug delivery system or DDSS. And self assembled nanostructure have shown their enormous potential. Uh, to be used as simplistic and efficient material for these purposes. So drug delivery is very essential area to address uh, to address uh, concern about relating to medicine and healthcare. However, there are several problems associated with the use of free drugs. So the first one is the stability issue of the free drug in biological system. Uh, the second one is insolubility in aqueous environment. The third one is short half-life. Uh, the fourth one is abnormality in biodistribution, and the last one is pharmac pharmacokinetics of the delivery system. So pharmacokinetics is how the drug is being delivered into our body, into the several parts, into the targeting parts. Okay, next. Okay, hence, um, <coughs> nanoparticle enhanced by self-assembly as drug delivery system can be used uh, as it offers several advantages. So the advantages of nanoparticle enhanced by self-assembly as a drug delivery system. So there are six, there are five actually. So the first one is particle size and surface properties of the nanoparticles are amenable. Uh, so this uh, to manipulation to achieve targeting drugs. The second one is, oh, sorry, nanoparticle consists of large surface area to mesh ratio. So this, um, so hence they can carry, absorb and bind large number of drug molecules. The third one is nanoparticle easily control the drug release during the process of uptake and internalization at the end and intended site. So this will help in reducing the side effects such as the toxicity of the drugs. Uh, furthermore, drug entrapment in nanoparticle is fairly high and this without any chemical reaction. Uh, instead, uh, they are preserved through physical interaction which aid in the preservation of the drug activity. So the last one is by attaching uh, specific ligands onto the nanoparticle surface, site-specific targeting can be achieved. Uh, next. <clears throat> so as what uh, Akif uh, discussed just now, so this is the article that we are referring to. So entitled, Defect Self-Assembly of Metal Organic Framework Triggers Ferroptosis to Overcome Resistance. So you guys might be wondering what is uh, actually defect self-assembly, right? So defect self-assembly is not like the self-assembly uh, the structure that self assembled have defect uh, here and there, but it actually uh, the <coughs> the molecules or the drug molecules uh, self assembled onto the defect area. So we will uh, see the example in short. So regarding this article, as discussed, uh, as Akif discussed just now, that the emergence of multi drug treatment resistant present a hurdle for a successful chemotherapy treatment. However, the ion, uh, the ion dependent buildup of lipid peroxide, known as ferroptosis, has the potential to reverse the multi drug uh, resistance. Okay, um, however, it's come to a challenge to deliver the ion sources, ferroptosis inducer, drug, and enhance circulation carrier within matrices simultaneously. <coughs> so, uh, regarding this article, uh, so the researchers has designed and fabricated a defect self-assembly of metal organic framework, MOF, with the red blood cell, RBC, membrane, camouflage, multi-drug delivery nanoplatform for combined ferroptosis, apoptosis, treatment for multi-drug resistant cancer. Uh, next. So we will see how it works. So this is the uh, illustration. So as illustrated in this picture, uh, ferroptosis as a, and a chemotherapy chemo, Chemotherapeutic drug are embedded into the center of iron, uh, ferrum triiron based MOF at defect site by coordination with metal cluster during the one pot server thermal synthesis process. Okay, so this will be further explained by you guys. Okay, um, 
Assalamualaikum and thank you for Akumal. And based on what Akumal have um, um, said before, uh, this is how uh, this diagram show how uh, defect cell assembly enable metal organic framework with encapsulated drug will form. So um, as you can see there, um, there is um, when we are producing this um, cell assembly MOF. Uh, we will be in this article. It will use um, Fe ions and also PAB. PAB is um, pseudo chloric acid B PAB, which is a drug used for exhibiting anti-cancer activity. And both of the <coughs> both of the molecules self-assemble, and it was linked with an organic linkage, which is the H2 BDC. And um, and the reaction of the metal ion and also the drug uh, has formed a structural defect of Fe based MOF. And the drugs that have been uh, incorporated in it will be confined during the formation of the MOF. And um, um, the, the introduction of this drug into this um, nano platform has uh, enhanced the delivery of this drug to the targeted cells. So, um, next. So the use of, uh, in this article, the use of MCF7 or ADR, which is a tumor bearing mice cells, uh, was used to test the efficacy of several types of MOF that have been developed. And, several, and this is the type of um, MOF that have been developed, which is the NMP, PNNP, DOX, PAB, PNNP dots and PNNP dots at RSBC. And in this case, we are focusing on this MOF, which is the PNNP dots at RBC. Next. Uh, so um, the synthesis of this MOF uh, was synthesized by coating a red blood cell uh, membrane um, by using a sonicator and the dots, the dots is actually the drugs is encapsulated in the pores of PNNP, uh, which, you, which is used to prevent leakage of the drug during the transfer of this drug in the bloodstream. So, <clears throat> next. So, um, the main importance of the use of this um, MOF, PNNP dots at RBC, is it can help in depleting glutathion GSH and glutathion peroxide level, uh, which is uh, which both of these um, substances are used as a regulator for cell protection from lipid peroxide and uh, is inhibiting phreptosis. As Akmal said before, uh, it is important for us to reduce um, uh, GSH in order uh, for peroxides to do its job for reducing the MDR, the multi-drug resistance. So, um, um, so the ferric uh, ion, Fe3, that is being used in the PNNP dots, uh, can help to deplete this um, substance, GSH, through catalyzed reduction reaction, which, uh, which will um, increase um, the function of raptosis in the cell. Next. So, um, as you can see in this diagram, it has shown the result of the use of PNNP dots at RBC to the reduction of the GSH levels. And as you can see, um, PNNP dots uh, has a better result compared to the other MOF. So, this um, MOF also uh, has displayed enough ability to eliminate cancer cells and overcome multi drug resistance as it increases intracellular oxidative stress and depletes the SH. And this statement can further be amplified, uh, be explained uh, through the diagram below. Next. So, um, as you can see, the PNMP has the lowest tumor invasion capacity compared to the other. And next. And as you can see, this is the cells that have been treated with this MOF after 14 days and as you can see um, from the down part the PNP dots at RBC produces the less size of the tumor which uh, which 
tell us that the tendency of PNP dogs at RBC to transfer drug is more effective than the others. Last. So therefore, it can be said that the use of this MOF of nanoparticle can enhance the delivery of this drug to the targeted cell and provide uh, the delivery of ion sources, proptosis, inducer drug, and also reducing multi drug resistance. And that's all from us. Thank you. Okay, assalamualaikum. Uh, so, just one simple question. As we presented just now, uh, the words of ferroptosis has been uh, said uh, multi, multi times. So, do you know what the function of my ferroptosis? Uh, what the use of the ferroptosis? If you want to, uh, yeah. you want to answer, just come in front. Uh, actually, I don't know, but okay. I can guess lah. I can guess. Yeah, sure. So, so for example, uh, maybe uh, ferroptosis. Ferroptosis. Ferroptosis means, uh, uh, for example, uh, apoptosis means uh, something like cell death. Yeah. So ferroptosis means uh, to make the cell. Uh, uh, able to uh, produce iron or something because uh, the word ferro in it. Uh, so, what exactly is it? Okay, okay, thanks for the answer. Actually, ferroptosis, as I mentioned earlier, the function of ferroptosis is actually to reverse the multi drug resistance. Okay, that's all. So, now it's time for the second group to present. So, the second group comprises of Obada, Rifdi, and also uh, Asfa. So they will present on different methods in making biosensor. So without further ado, uh, I pass uh, to the group. Assalamualaikum everyone. Okay, Assalamualaikum everyone. Uh, we are from group two. My name is Rifdi Izzat. This is uh, Yasin Obada. And my other member is Azfa. Okay, so uh, the main article we used is uh, titled Comparison of Different Strategies for the Development of Highly Sensitive Electrochemical Nucleic Acid Biosensors Using Neither Nanomaterials Nor Nucleic Acid Amplification okay. the, paper is, oh, right. uh, okay, the paper is published in 2018 by Ruiz Valdez-Penas, Montiel Okay, Next. okay so... Uh, so what is a highly sensitive nucleic acid biosensor? Okay. A nucleic acid biosensor is a, is a biosensor that relies on the operation between a bioreceptor and a target, which will produce a reaction, okay, which then transmits an electric signal. Okay. All right. So I will show you the concept of a biosensor. So mainly, okay. So here you have your analytes, which is your your targets. Okay, this will be your bioreceptor. Here will be your transducer. As your analytes bind to your bioreceptor, a signal will be produced. Okay? But for our case, it is a nucleic acid biosensor. So our nucleic acid biosensor is So how a DNA biosensor works is 
a single strand, which is your analyte, will bind to your bioreceptor here, okay, and then a signal will be produced. You guys understand? Okay. All right. So, um, what happens after your after your target binds with your bioreceptor is a process called hybridization. So when your single strand binds with your bioreceptor, a process called hybridization will occur, and a signal will be produced. Okay, uh, yeah, electrical signal will be outputted by your transducer. Yeah, you guys, understand? So, all right. So, what is the advantages of using a DNA biosensor? Okay. Uh, okay. The advantages of using a nucleic acid biosensor is you can detect ultra low levels of DNA, of uh, which would um, which would uh, be used to read SNPs. Okay. So what is an SNP? It is a single nucleotide. Sorry, uh, it is a single nucleotide polymorphism. So what is a single nucleotide polymorphism? Okay. You, you guys remember base pairing, CG18? Right. So let's say. So let's say this would uh, this would be your um, ordinary normal nucleotide. So a single nucleotide polymorphism is when the sequence mutates to another. You see here, it's supposed to be your it's supposed to be your cytosine, but it changes into a thymine. You guys understand? So what happens is it might uh, code for an S so this would be your S this would be an SNP. So uh, this kind of stuff, especially in okay. So uh, SNPs in DNA mismatch repair, cell cycle regulation, metabolism, and immunity are associated to cancer. Are associated to cancer. So this kind of SNPs. Uh, are commonly which uh, leads to cancer. Okay. All right. uh, next. One. So okay. So uh, the most common methods for SNP detection is your PCR. Okay. Uh, polymerase chain reaction. Okay. So your polymers, your polymerase chain reactions uh, has three cycles, right? Okay, so denaturation occurs at 90 to 95 degrees Celsius. Annealing occurs at 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. And your elongation happens at 70 degrees Celsius. So uh, you guys remember denaturation? Okay, okay. So at high temperatures, your double helix DNA, uh, it separates into double single strands. Right? So uh, the annealing is when? You insert your primer here. Okay, so this uh, this primer will bind to your single strand at 50 to 60 degrees Celsius because you lower the temperature, and elongation will occur. Right? Elongation will occur with your DNA polymerase, and we usually use the tag polymerase. Which is a polymerase found in bacteria, 
Thermus Aquaticus. Alright. So, after 30 cycles, um, when your primer has elongated, so you will mainly uh, obtain this DNA, correct? So, in the concentration of a PCR, once you have done like 30 cycles, your main DNA will be the one that you have elongated. So, but then again, there will be uh, contamination. Do you guys understand? Okay, uh, there will be some genetics which are which was not uh, elongated, but then again, there is some sort of contamination. Okay, so uh, so next. So this contamination will lead to inaccuracy in your results. Right? All right. So with this in mind, it will it will be uh, it will be an advantage to use another method which does not uh, have too much contamination. So uh, based on our main article, uh, we are going to present to you methods which does not uh, use your DNA, apa, polymerase chain reaction. Which uses DNA vitrification. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Uh, so I will continue. Uh, with uh, methodologies part and as we can see uh, there are five assay format that we use uh, to compare the performance of electrochemical nucleic acid based by sensor and all of them will target the same uh, target which is the first upper the second one all right the first one is the sandwich dna dna so uh, sandwich dna dna is uh, based on the detection of hybridization event between two specific organic probes. Uh, so I can see, uh, in the picture there are two probes, which is the capture probe and detector probe. Uh, the capture probe will be at the bottom one, which is uh, start at the solid support, and the uh, target will be in the middle, and the at the above will be the detector. Uh, where the capture probe is used to immobilize the target sequence on a solid support and detection probe is labeled with a detectable marker. The detectable marker will be the enzymatic labeling. So as you can see, there are many enzymatic labeling. So actually, enzymatic labeling is the uh, method used in bioanalysis to place a chemical marker on a molecule within a substance. So molecular labels allows a molecule in substance to be detected and traced during chemical analysis. So this is the first one. Uh, the second one is the competitive DNA DNA format. So basically, this format uh, allows more accurate and reproducible quantification of specific mRNAs. And this format, when we have a higher uh, capture probe that we use, then it will be easier to be uh, find the target, right? So, uh, when we use this format, the, the background signal from the non-regulated genes can be increased and reduced. It uh, depends on what we want, uh, whether we want to high or low. Uh, and you the signal from differentially regulated genes to be contrasted and to be identified in a quantitative manner. Okay, the third one is the format of consentimus. Uh, so, what is consentimus? As we see in the figure, consentimus is long continuous DNA that connected to each other. Actually, there is two identical, same DNA. Uh, and DNA consentimus uh, provide multiple repeat sites for binding multiple oligonucleotides props. The accumulated props can effectively amplify signals when using this format. Uh, and the fourth and fifth will be the uh, capture or detector. Uh, RNA uh, direct hybridization capsule to bioreceptor. So basically, uh, both of these will be using direct uh, hybrid to the bioreceptor. Uh, by direct hybridization involves a linear application of the entire transcriptome of 
particular sample of interest. So basically, our, how do we want to differentiate between capture and detector? Because since uh, they both use the A, B, and A, the difference is when A, B, and A is uh, stuck at the solid support as a magnetic bit, it will be the capture. And when it's not stuck, but others at the solid support, it will be detector. So, uh, so this is the all of oligo neutral type that we will use in this article. I'm Yasin Obada, and uh, I'm going to talk about the results of uh, our method that used for the biosensoring for the, the cells. Okay. Uh, basically, we have the target and the sequence uh, from five to three. We have the rule, which is the targeting. Uh, it's applied for all the formats, uh, from the first format until the 11th, the last one. And we have uh, the DNA CB, BDNA CB, which is the biotin, uh, basically. Uh, the role of this uh, method is to capture the probe and it's applied in the sandwich uh, hybridization uh, in uh, the first and second format. And uh, the second one, which is the B, DNA, and uh, B, uh, which is a detector uh, probe and applied in the sandwich also. And also we can see the uh, F, I, T, C, and also the rest of them. Uh, of the method, uh, of the methods until uh, yeah, until the FITC uh, target, all of them like uh, detector expect the RNA fortimer, which is a capture probe, and uh, it's applied in the competitive uh, and also the detection of B AB RNA. Okay, next. Yeah. Uh, no, next. Okay, so. That's all for us. Okay, uh, any questions? Or should I ask a question? Okay, uh, my question is about uh, why the sandwich uh, hybridization format used? I'm not sure actually, I just yes. wanted to get it over with. Yes. Uh, contamination, to avoid contamination? Is it the answer, no, yes? Uh, no. No, okay. <laughs> Uh, basically, it's used to uh, compare the traditional labeling, which is uh, between the strip H, uh, HRB and also the DNA detector uh, probes to the fluorescent FITC and also the anti uh, the FITC HRB. Okay, that's all for us. Okay, uh, so now we come to the, our last group uh, to present today. So it's about a glucose biosensor. This group consists of Tania, Iman, uh, Safwan Fati, and Afik. So without further ado, let's uh, start the presentation. Okay, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, uh, most people around the world, especially in Malaysia, uh, can be exposed to the diabetes, right? You know what is diabetes? Okay. When we are exposed, uh, when we talk about diabetes, we are focusing on our diet. Okay. Uh, for example, you know, like in Malaysia, we have uh, almost um, we have uh, more tasty food, right? Uh, can Akmal give an example? What is a tasty food in Malaysia? Uh, Oh, nasi goreng. Yeah, a very good example because rice is also contain a glucose, right? Okay, so uh, when we talk about diabetes, uh, it is a disease. Okay, so when uh, and when it is a disease, uh, so there is the way on how we want to screen it or diagnose it for uh, to diagnose um, the patient who have the diabetes. Okay, or we can have a one uh, one tooth that can help doctors to for a long term uh, management of the diabetes patients okay uh, so without further ado hi my name is Safwan and together with my team Iman, Tanya and Afi we will present about a glucose biosensor 
Okay. Okay. Next. Okay. So basically, what is a glucose biosensor? Glucose biosensor is a tool. Uh, it's a sensor to a uh, measure to measure a blood glucose level. Okay. So to begin with, um, we pick a small amount of blood from the patient. Uh, at least a prick, uh, you know, from a fingertip. Okay. We pick the blood and then we put in the the sensor. So the sensor will will run and try to diagnose a glucose level based on the uh, blood pressure, uh, blood of the patient. Okay. So uh, so next next slide. Okay. So. The first uh, glucose biosensor was founded by uh, Leland uh, C. Clark, which is also considered as a father of the biosensor. Okay, uh, basically, glucose biosensor is an ampero amperometric electrochemical biosensor. Okay, um, that generates current from the electrochemical reaction between glucose and a layer of glucose oxidase. Glucose oxidase is an enzyme. Okay, oxidase, you know, is, is enzyme. Okay, and then <laughs> we have uh, electrode. Electrode, um, based on the first experiment founded by C. Clark, uh, Leland C. Clark, uh, he used uh, a platinum. But you know, platinum is a expensive metal, right? Uh, so for the commercial part, like we, like we can find in the hospital, it's actually made from graphite, okay, which is much cheaper. Okay, so... Uh, the use of iridium oxide in the glucose biosensor, uh, particle X uh, electron to transfer from glucose oxidase to working electrodes. Okay, because uh, when glucose uh, meet the glu uh, enzyme and then produce gluconic acid, where gluconic acid produce electron. Okay, so when the electron will help. Uh, the redox re reaction over here and then detect by electrode and then the result found eh? Okay, so that's the basic. Okay, without adding further ado, uh, I will pass to Iman Jamil to to explain the detail eh? Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, Thank you Safwan I'm kind of nervous. Okay. Safwan mentioned something about redox earlier. So I'll expand on that in my part, the development of glucose biosensor. As a rough overview of this section, we'll discuss the first to third generation of glucose biosensor and then a few others. The first uh, generation, it measures glucose concentration using the production of hydrogen peroxide up there. I can't reach, but yes, hydrogen peroxide. So what happens is, Glucose is oxidized into gluconic acid with the help of our enzyme, glucose oxidase, uh, by donating electron to FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide, which will then be changed to FADH2. This FAD will be regenerated when it um, reacts with oxygen, forming hydrogen peroxide. And then the hydrogen peroxide will be oxidized on the electrode, so the amount of electron transfer that happens reflects the amount of glucose molecule present. So there's a flow there. Is the flow clear? Because we have to make sure that it's clear before we change things up here and there to better the device. Yes? Okay. So there's some problem here with the, first, the design of the first generation. The first problem is that the electrode, as said by Safon, is very expensive. It's platinum, so it's exclusively used in the clinical laboratory setting. So the second one, there's a thing called oxygen deficiency because there's a limited amount of soluble oxygen in our blood. And then the hydrogen peroxide, um, it, is, it causes deactivation of glucose oxidase enzyme. Right, so this needs improvement, which is seen in the second generation. Yes, okay, as you can see, we remove the use of oxygen and hydrogen peroxide. We use redox mediators. So it's essentially doing the same thing. It's just using a different material to do the same thing. So this redox mediators, some examples are ferrocene or quinine. Uh, we see that uh, it 
removes the disadvantages of oxygen and hydrogen peroxide, but there's also some disadvantages as well because it is highly toxic and also because it may leach due to its highly diffusive nature and the size is very small. Which brings us to the third generation. Yeah, it removes the use of redox mediators completely. So how it does this is that uh, this is the electrode surface, okay? And then they immobilize our enzyme, the glucose oxidase, onto the electrode surface to establish a deep connection between the active site of the enzyme and the surface of the electrode. So this is the third generation, and that was the first to third generation of glucose biosensor. So because of the improvement and trials and exploration from scientists, we have a few others like non-invasive glucose monitoring device that will be explained by Radafi. And then we have non-enzymatic biosensor where, uh, as you can see just now, we removed oxygen, we removed hydrogen peroxide, we removed redox, bio redox mediator, but this one also removed the use of glucose oxidase as well, but it still works. And then we have continuous glucose monitoring system where the device is put inside our body, like our arm or stomach, and then the device will transmit the data wirelessly into our phone, tablet, smartwatch, so that we can continuously monitor how our activity and how our diet impact our glucose level and also our body health. And then we have a point of care testing where the device is specially designed so that it, we can move it anywhere. It, you don't have to go visit the clinic or you, have to, you don't have to visit the lab for the device to work. Okay, thank you. Um, so hi, I'm Tanya. I will be talking about uh, bio nano usage in glucose biosensor. So first, um, in biosensor, we want that sensitivity uh, for better performance. So we can characterize the better performance as higher sensitivity of the glucose biosensor. So in this biosensor, we need to use nanomaterials because they have high surface area ratio. Because when they have high surface area to volume ratio, this, will, this means that they have more surface area exposed to the surrounding. And this will lead to loading rate, meaning that they can, in, they can be in contact with more electrolytes. And this will increase the electron transfer, meaning faster electron mobility. They can move to one point to one point faster. And it will lead to sensitivity. Electron transfer is where the reduct reaction occurs. Lah. Um, okay, so skip this next. Okay, so there are many types of nanomaterials, which is we have nanoparticles. This is among the nanomaterials we use. We have nanoparticles, nanorods, nanowires, and nanotubes. Uh, but among all of these, nanorods, nanowires, and nanotubes are more famous and common. Okay. Um, if you can see from this, all these three has a common shape, which is cylinder, rod-like. Next. Okay. okay. So they all belong to one-dimensional nanomaterials, which have... Um, sorry. All right, so we have three. Okay. Oops, sorry. So um, zero dimensional means <laughs> so zero dimensional means they have zero dimension this way, but one dimension is this rod like, and two D is using two dimension and so on. Okay. So um, we use one dimensional because it is more fibrous. They have more natural channels than 2D and zero dimensional. Next slide, please. Okay, so, okay, so one dimensional means uh, they have, they are like this, right? Okay, so like this. They have higher aspect ratio. 
then compared to plate like this is 2D. This is 1D and this is 0D. So higher aspect ratio means that I do. So I don't so I don't have to bayar for all this jatuh, right? <laughs> okay, so meaning that the electron can move from here to here faster. High, faster electron mobility, but for this one, even though it has uh, more surface area to um, volume ratio, the electron needs to move here, here, here. It's not, it's not efficient. So that's why we use one directional um, nanomaterial. Uh, but in one directional material, uh, nanorods, nanotube, and nanowires, they also have different structures. And we all know that structures determine its function. So among all of, all of these three, we choose nanorods, which is the smallest of this, of this 1D nanomaterial. It can be made from most elements, um, and it is more flexible. OK. That's all from me. Thank you. Mm. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Safi Dek Putra. I will be presenting the next part, biotensor performance and future. Okay, next. Okay, the, the application of biosensor is actually a brilliant idea, right? You know, if, if not because of biosensor, we will not know if we have diabetes or not. And, Unlike, unless we, we are sick or and all that. But because of this biosensor, glucose biosensor, we can detect the sugar level of our body. Um, so, so that's how Brother Safwan have uh, explained before. They, they use this device, traditionally they use this device that prick the, the blood from your fingertips and extract the blood and use it for sampling to, to check the glucose level which is to see if it is high or low. So, but no one here likes to be pricked, right? Do you like to be pricked? <laughs> no, no one, no one here like, likes pain, right? So, this why um, more and more research has been done to, to bring a more me new method to, to test the sugar level inside our body. So this is what we call a non-invasive uh, glucose biosensor. So, so, okay. This, um, in, uh, that, there's an article that I, that I read that, that shows that uh, we can detect a glucose level by using a device that detects that use sweat as a sample for for detecting the glucose level. So this is just a picture. This is not an actual device that on the article. It's just uh, one of the things that that uses the same thing, the same method. So this this thing is attached onto your arm. So in which uh, in which case you are, you are sweating. This device will uh, extract your sweat and then check the glucose level inside your body. So, however, this thing comes, does not come without disadvantage. This also has a disadvantage as, uh, as the traditional methods. Because uh, when we use this, this uh, machine, uh, we tense because sweat needs you need to to produce sweat in order to to see the glucose level, right? But if there's no sweat, there there's no measurement of glucose level. So yeah, that that's that's a trade-off of it. But and there's also another disadvantage to to this, which is your arm is not actually clean. So if there's a grime or dead skin on your body, it will affect the inaccuracy and the accuracy of the device. So next. 
So what is what's the future has to offer? So we had, that there actually more and more research done to see to see which which has, which method actually can improve the glucose uh, to see the glucose level inside our body without breaking ourselves. So this is one of the method that proposed. It is actually using your saliva. You know, right? How how we use our saliva to see the antigen in our body to see if there's COVID virus, right? So this is the same. They basically basically using using your saliva. They they like I think lick it, and this this thing is connected to your to your phone, and you can actually just see it. You don't need you don't need another device. You don't need another another expensive tools to do it. So so it's actually a good a good way of doing it. Um, yeah, I think that's all for for me. And uh, I'll be handling this presentation to Brasafan to wrap it up. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think there's no wrap up. Uh, that's all from us. Thank you. Uh, but for the question, I think uh, Sister Tania, you have a question, right? For them. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. So for my question, I think it's not just it's not as simple, but okay. From this slide. You can see I mentioned about an amperometric electrochemical biosensor. Do you have any rough idea what is the amperometric electrochemical biosensor? <laughs> ah, amperometric. Ah. Okay, you can come. You see, uh, I don't know, but. Huh? Fetch them. Fetch them. them. Okay. You see, I don't know, but <laughs> uh, I can guess lah. I can guess uh, because um, so so metric is a measurement. So ampere is ampere. So maybe the the what you call it the the thing the electrochemical biosensor when uh, it it detects the uh, yeah, uh, the oxidize or electron or something and you receive some electron. Uh, we can we can uh, we can convert uh, it to uh, to empiric values instead uh, empiric ampere instead of uh, volts volumetric. So because uh, ampere is the measurement of current and volt is the measurement of uh, energy potential. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for you. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, that's that's pretty scary. Okay, so um, for the answer uh, given from the Ayman, uh, it's true. But there are there are one thing that you need to put in the answer lah, the redox part. Ah, so the ah electron transfer. Okay, you mentioned it. It's okay. Okay, that's a, that's a that's true answer lah. Okay, I think that's all from us. Thank you. Eh?